Good morning, everyone. We just opened up uh, this morning's Zoom conference, so everyone's joining us. Thank you so much for your patience and waiting in the waiting room. Uh, hopefully, you're keeping six feet of distance between each of you. Uh, I am Gil Price. I'm the Executive Director of Condominium Law Group, and thank you for joining us for our fourth Zoom conference on COVID-19, and we're going to just do a general Q&A. We do have um, a few admin uh, things I'd like to share with you, especially if you're not familiar with Zoom. So uh, you'll see a black window. If you have it on uh, grid view, you should be able to see all the other folks that are participating in this morning's Zoom conference. So uh, go to the bottom left of the black screen, the black Zoom screen, you'll see mute, you'll see video. So you don't want to be seen, uh, just don't click stop video. If you click stop video, if there's a red line through it, uh, it means that we can't see you and that's fine. Uh, if you unclick it, then you allow us to see you. Um, if you go down again along the bottom toolbar, you're gonna see chat. If you click on it, <clears throat> a window off to the right of your Zoom window will open up and you'll see the Zoom group chat. And uh, you can click on the down arrow, you can send a message to everyone, you can send a message to each other. <clears throat> um, so feel free to use that if you have any questions uh, for us this morning. I know that Valerie and Ken, which I'll introduce now, we've got Valerie Oman, she's one of our <laughs> partners at Condominium Law Group, and we have Ken Hare, he's the other partner at Condominium Law Group. And uh, I know that they've got a topic already that they would like to start off with this morning. Um, I didn't receive any comments and I'll be checking my email periodically as we go through this morning's uh, Zoom conference, but I didn't see any emails uh, come through from any of our friends or colleagues. I do want to welcome all of our community association managers that are joining us this morning. Um, and we'll continue to, uh, to do these weekly Zoom conferences as long as we have interest. Um, everyone seems to be pretty excited about these and it's a good way to get some, some education about what's going on in the uh, industry, what's going on in our industry with condos and HOAs and dealing with meetings and how to go about that, plus a, a number of other topics. Um, there's one other thought that I had. Uh, oh yeah, we have a number of board members um, that are also joining us and welcome to you as well. I know a lot of our managers, uh, community association managers that manage the associations have been asking me over the last couple of weeks if board members can join it. Absolutely, by all means, the more the merrier. So um, we're glad to, to see uh, all of you who have uh, allowed us to see you with your video. Um, and uh, if you have any questions during this Zoom conference, please use the chat off to the right-hand side. In order to access that, just go down to the bottom toolbar, click on chat, and a new window will open on to the right. So I'm gonna let uh, Ken and Valerie start this morning. I know that there's some information that's come out from the governor that's gonna be very, very important for, for all of you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'll just go ahead and jump in and start. Um, also, I want to remind everybody that if you could keep yourself on mute, unless you actually want to talk, that would be helpful. Currently, everybody is muted, and that's on purpose because when you've got 20 or 44, as we have now, people on a Zoom conference at one time, and we're not all muted, it gets very noisy very quickly. So um, you, if you are muted, you can just press your space bar and hold it down, and that will unmute you temporarily if you want to ask a question vocally. Or like Gil said, you can use the chat function, um, which is right down there to ask a question. So um, I wanted to start by filling you in on a couple of different things that happened in the last few days. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Supreme Court of Washington finally issued an updated order on access to courts. Uh, they had, I think, probably been holding off um, since their previous order, which was two or three weeks old. Uh, probably in the hopes that they would get a little bit more guidance from the governor's office in terms of how long the stay at home orders will be in place. There's a, I think a fairly high degree of expectation um, on most people's part that it will be extended past May 4th. Um, and I hope that I'm not <laughs> raining on anybody's parade or, or shocking anybody by saying that, but um, <clears throat> I think the Supreme Court just decided they couldn't continue to wait and, and get a better sense for how long this was all going to last. And so they, um, 
issued an order that clarifies uh, what things can continue to happen in our county um, and local courts and what things are basically on hold indefinitely. And uh, consistent with their previous order, uh, civil trials, jury trials are all suspended until at least after May 4th, but also anything that's considered a non-emergency civil matter the only way the court is hearing basically any type of motion that's not considered an emergency. An emergency would be something like removing a, a, you know, a child from an abusive family situation or a restraining order due to domestic violence. Those are, those are exceptions to these general rules. Most of the types of things that we handle for our clients are not considered emergency matters. Um, and everything that's a, considered a non-emergency civil matter, the only way the court is willing to, or the Supreme Court is willing to allow lower courts to hear those um, matters is if they can be handled either telephonically or by video or some other non-in-person method. Um, I have a friend who's actually, who was recently appointed to the King County Superior Court, uh, just a friend that I grew up with and um, he shares that most of the judges in King County, uh, or at least at the Seattle Courthouse, which is where he's located, are chomping at the bit to get back to work, but trying to figure out the logistics of how to make that happen in a way that's um, equitable to, uh, to everybody who needs access to the court system. So one of the things we don't think about super often or that our clients may not think about too often is uh, there are many people who need access to the courts who don't have lawyers to represent them. So for us, accessing the courts is relatively easy, especially in King County, Pierce County as well. Snohomish County is very slowly coming along, but um, there's e-filing, electronic filing. You can do certain things without even um, having an actual hearing where the judge will just decide things based on the paperwork. Um, but individual people who are not represented by attorneys don't have the same type of access or ease of filing things as attorneys do. And so that's part of what the courts are trying to figure out. So. Um, I had a, a manager email me yesterday saying, uh, well, we can't file a foreclosure lawsuit, right? Because basically the courts are shut down until COVID-19 goes away. Um, and that's not actually the case. So um, it is possible to continue forward with uh, lawsuits on behalf of our clients right now. Um, some of the things that we're doing a little bit differently in recognition of the fact that court access is limited um, include that we're whenever we can, which is tr possible for foreclosure lawsuits, not possible for just personal lawsuits for a judgment, we are, um, instead of filing the lawsuit first, we're just sending it to the homeowners directly by mail, regular and certified mail. Um, and part of the rationale behind doing that is that um, even if, you know, 5% of the time, it means the owner reaches out to us and resolves the delinquency by proposing a payment plan or settling with the association, um, it's worth taking that step, even if only a, a relatively small number of them end up being resolved because of it. Um, and mailing the lawsuit under certain circumstances is also an authorized method of serving a lawsuit. It's not all, that's not always true, but um, so that's kind of how we're we're starting things a little bit more slowly than we normally do and, a, and differently than we normally do. But it is still possible to take these steps for our clients. So um, I don't want to linger too much on the court stuff unless there are questions which you guys can um, submit to Gil in the chat function. So the other thing that happened yesterday that is related to collecting unpaid assessments is that Governor Inslee has temporarily halted all wage and bank garnishments in Washington state. Uh, it's a one month moratorium on gar garnishment it doesn't mean that you won't be able to collect in the future. It, uh, it just means that we can't do any new garnishments starting yesterday and continuing through midnight on May 14th. So if we, uh, we, have, we do have a handful, I have a handful of files where we were either garnishing somebody's wages or about to garnish a bank account. That just means we have to put that process on hold and wait for the order um, preventing that to expire, which at this point is scheduled to happen in one month. So um, that doesn't affect anything else that we do uh, to collect unpaid assessments, but there are other things happening. I think we've mentioned in previous Zoom calls that the sheriffs right now, the county sheriffs are um, unilaterally not related to the court order, uh, court, the court order limiting access to the courts. The sheriffs are just not doing sheriff sales right now. They're postponing them 60 days. 
Um, so the assessment recovery process is still something that we are able to um, move forward with. It's just things are slowed down quite a bit right now. I guess that's the best way to put it. So, um, Ken, you had some other stuff you wanted to cover too, right? Well, uh, yes. Uh, the last thing related to collections is that the CAI National, I think, is still advising that associations record liens for debts that uh, are owed to the association, but they are advising not to start foreclosures uh, for the immediate future. And I'm not sure if that's because they think it's uh, uh, gonna be unsuccessful or if they think the political backlash to a board of doing heavy handed collections during the COVID-19 crisis is gonna come back and, and hurt them. And that's really one of the things you have to think about is how is the collection effort you're doing going to be perceived by your membership as a whole? And that's why we have recommended that if an owner reaches out to you and asks for a payment plan that you try and work something out. But it's also why we think if they don't reach out, you can respond to, an, to other owners who ask why you're doing it to say that until an owner has at least said they need help, there's no reason for the board to change its collections policies. So other things that sort of have gone on in the last week, uh, there has been a, I'd say a significant decline in the number of specifically COVID-19 related questions coming into our office. And that also is reflected in a drop of specifically COVID-19 questions on CAI's national um, court of, uh, chat board that they use. And so we're getting more of the sort of usual questions about enforcement or complaints about, you know, remodels that have been done without authorization, things like that. And so one of the things that is going to continue is a challenge for boards to investigate whether or not a violation has occurred because of the stay at home order and people wanting to refuse access to their homes, which is a reasonable thing for them to do at this time. So we've had a, a number of, of complaints coming in, accusing the board of not doing enough to enforce noise complaints or complaints about smoke. And the answer really is that you, you don't have the ability because of the stay at home order to do the same investigation you might normally and you can say that back to the owners. And, you know, we, we draft a letter yesterday to an owner complaining about, uh, I think it was marijuana smoke. And it's just not possible for the board to go into everybody's units and the surrounding units to figure out who's doing the smoking. And it's not possible for them to do a normal investigation. And so we basically had to help explain that to the owner because the the manager making the same explanation was not not being received well by the uh, the individual owner who was complaining. Uh, access for repairs. If you are doing some kind of repair for an emergency, you may still need access. But we had a client where there was a water leak. Um, the water remediation vendor wanted to get into the neighboring unit downstairs and cut open the ceiling and dry out the structure and the unit owner refused them access. And so it's certainly possible that there was water inside the structure which would cause problems, but the person who would suffer from that is the owner who's refusing access. So we think that on balance, you're okay honoring the request not to enter the unit and the structure will dry out anyway. It's just gonna dry out slower. And the risk of mold, which the vendor is trying to sell on to the board, declines every day that you go without moisture because the mold can't grow without the moisture. And so if you get to a month and the owner has refused access, the moisture is, is almost certainly completely dried out. And even if mold had started to grow in that time, it stops growing when the moisture goes away and the mold might be sitting inside that encapsulated ceiling structure, but it's not gonna hurt anybody. It's just gonna sit there and do nothing. So you can 
basically relax about the urgency related to the scare of mold, because right now the scare of the virus is greater to people than the scare of the mold. And it's okay to basically let that individual owner decide. So, you know, it's certainly reasonable to say to an owner when you've got a water leak that you know has occurred that the vendor would like to come in and open up the ceiling and dry it out. If they say no, honor that request. It's a reasonable request on their part. And they're the only ones who actually may suffer. And the damage is not gonna get worse over weeks. It's gonna basically reduce as the structure dries out. You can advise them to keep their fans running to keep a, you know fresh air coming through so things will dry out faster. Uh, but otherwise, you, know, you, you are hamstrung by the environmental conditions you've got. Ken, uh, I have a question. I have a question that's come in through our group chat. Uh, uh, it, it's an add-on to the to what you've just mentioned. So the question is, what if it impacts another unit? Can they refuse access in the case of other units being impacted? Well, the answer is, uh, you know, technically no, because the association has easements through every unit into another to repair the common areas, but you have to evaluate just how much risk there is. The, the reality is if you had a, you know, a washing machine on one floor leak and water goes into the neighbor downstairs, uh, the damage to either one of them alone is gonna be limited pretty much to that unit. So if the owner of the washing machine refuses access, you would leave it alone. If the neighbor downstairs allows access, you'd cut holes into the ceiling to dry out the structure. If the upstairs neighbor allows access, you'd go in and remove all the wet flooring material and you would leave alone the fact that water had, had traveled through the ceiling structure of the unit below. Ken, thank you. Um, we have a uh, we have an, a, a member that has uh, raised their hand. I've not seen this before, so this is new to me. So um, we're going to unmute Vicky. Hi, Vicky. How are you? I'm fine. I've been on enough Zoom meetings lately that you <laughs> raise the hand thing. Cool. Uh, I just kind of have an extension on what Ken, you were just now talking about. I had a manager tell me yesterday that, it, and she's a manager of a, a, a fairly large HOA down in the Federal Way area. And when she's writing these compliance letters, you know, move your garbage can, you know, clean your weeds, whatever, she's getting the same response that the mold person you just talked about. Um, because of the COVID 19, I can't go outside, I can't do this. Um, how far do we carry it? You know, I can understand what you're saying about the mold. Uh, what about moving the garbage cans or cleaning up your weeds or raking your lawn or those kind of things? All these compliance issues. Well, if it were me, I would probably back off considerably on enforcement. Um, it's a temporary delay. I mean, we're looking at maybe another, you know, three weeks, four weeks. Um, I think it is reasonable to ask them to comply still, but I wouldn't be issuing fines for people. And to some extent, it's a matter of trying to help them get other volunteers. I don't think anyone's gonna go out weeding their yard right now, but it may be that their next door neighbor would help bring the garbage cans up to the garage for them if, if they are you know, too afraid to walk out their front door and do it themselves. There's no question that some owners are going to use the COVID-19 as an excuse to not comply. And it's gonna be unreasonable of them to do that. The problem is there are gonna be a lot more people who are genuinely afraid and are reasonably using COVID-19 as an excuse to not comply. And it's really difficult to tell the difference. And I would, for, I would suggest that for the most part, you err on the side of accommodating people's requests about COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a temporary change and you know I don't know how many of the landscaping services are out working in violation of the stay at home order. So I would guess that the, um, the appearance of many of our communities as the grass starts to grow with a vengeance this month is, is going to fall below our typical standards. And you're gonna to have to just accept that 
and we can get the standards back up to normal as we get into the summer. So I just want to add a few things. I know that some people have joined us after uh, our 10 a.m. start. So if you're new to Zoom, just go down to the bottom of the Zoom window. You're going to see a bottom taskbar there. Um, there is a chat feature. If you click on that, you'll see a Zoom group chat open up, a window on your right open up. You can send messages to everyone. You can send messages to me with any questions that you might have. Uh, we are, we had a question earlier. We are record, recording this Zoom conference. We've recorded the previous three. I do send out emails uh, later today um, and I'm kind of recapping all of the other recordings. We have them on our Condominium Law Group YouTube channel, which I created last year, I believe last summer um, with the Wukaiwa videos that we had, uh, training sessions that we had done and recorded as well. So um, you'll see those there. Um, and then Ken had mentioned CAI. If you're not familiar with CAI, that's Community Associations Institute. It's a really terrific nonprofit for our industry. Um, they, our local chapter is the Washington State CAI or Washington State Community Associations Institute or WSCAI.org. Ken and Valerie have been instructors uh, for many of their, their seminars and courses that they, they put on throughout the year and they've been doing that for several years. So that's a great resource if you're not familiar with it. Um, they provide wonderful educational opportunities um, to, to board members and managers and homeowners <coughs> in the industry. So um, I don't see any other questions coming well, in. I've got one other topic to cover. Sure. Thanks, Ken. So the, the last topic, which is sort of now coming up is how to deal with contracts where the service has been interrupted. And so this could be uh, something like your landscaping or cleaning services where the, uh, the vendor cannot perform because they are uh, under stay at home orders, or it could be, you know, a large construction contract or re-roofing contract where the vendor's work has been interrupted. I, I do think it is worth at least having a conversation with these vendors to see what they're thinking about in terms of performance and payment. I've had some vendors who want to be paid even though they're not performing. Uh, I'm not sure I consider that particularly fair. I've had one const major construction contract where the contractor is actually proposing and the architect has recommended that the association agree that they will waive any claims for additional costs related to the delays if the association agrees to waive any claims that they might have related to the de delays, such as liquidated damages or you know, claims that somehow the association could hurt. And <clears throat> at least for this particular client, that's a, I, I think a fair trade. The contracts did not anticipate this kind of a force majeure or interruption in the ability of the parties to perform. And so I'm not exactly sure why the contractor proposed this, but I'm going to let the architect's recommendation go to the client uh, in basically saying that everyone is going to agree that there's no additional cost to either side as a result of COVID-19. If you've got something like a landscaping contract and they're not doing the work, it's better to talk to them early and come to a common understanding of what you guys think is fair than to wait until July and be slapped with invoices for two or three months worth of work that hasn't been performed. You might agree to extend a contract by the same number of months that the service has been delayed. That would be something which would, would uh, give something to the contractor for the, the time that they can't work. But it is, you know, I would say valuable to talk to your vendors and see what they're thinking. Even if you don't agree with it, uh, it's better to know what people are thinking about so that you might be able to work out some kind of agreement. If you have a dispute resolution provision in your contract, find that out now because it would be good to know if you've got something like a mediation or arbitration provision as a easy way to retain your relationship with the vendor 
and let the unpleasant decision come from a third party. Because if you've got something like an arbitration provision, then it's, it's much easier to say, well, I'm sorry, we disagree. Let's just let the, uh, the third party tell us what's fair for the, or, or, or what's correct for how much money we owe or how much performance you owe, and we can retain our relationship. So that was my only other real add is, is you know, deal with the construction contracts early. If you have not actually entered into the contract yet, I think that you can edit the contract to deal with the COVID-19 um, emergencies that may come up again, because you know, there's certainly the potential that we will have a second round of, uh, of efforts by the government to impose social distancing, which may also impact construction. Uh, I guess the one last thing I'll have, which I think I mentioned one previous week is, I do have a client where the architect was willing to, in writing, certify that the construction work that was being performed was essential and necessary to the safety of the building. And if you have an architect who's willing to give that kind of an opinion, then it is possible for the contractor to work again, uh, even if the, the project looks like a non-essential re-roofing job. So if you want your project to proceed or there is a concern that the building is at risk because the, the fire structure, or, you know, fire rated assemblies are in, impaired or the structure of the building is significantly impaired, uh, talk to your architect or engineer about getting that kind of a, um, of a letter from them. Okay. So that's what I've got unless there are other questions. We do actually, Ken, we have a question regarding uh, electronic voting, elections, meetings during this time period. Would you like to address that, please? Well, uh, right now, most associations do not have the authority to hold those in their governing documents. On the other hand, we think it's reasonable to do it anyway, uh, especially if it avoids you violating your declaration by not holding the uh, annual meeting. Uh, so it's kind of a, you know, lesser of two evils. If it's, if you've already failed to comply with a requirement to do the meeting within the first quarter, I would say go ahead and set up a, a Zoom type meeting or some other electronic means where people can hear and people can comment. Uh, there's actually a statute under the Ukiowa which sets out the criteria for how to hold electronic meetings for your members and they provide for combining votes by mail with votes taken at a meeting. And, and I think it's reasonable for you to use that process and then to, to kind of be a belts and suspenders type of person after we're done with the COVID-19 stay at home orders you can hold another meeting and ratify any decisions that were made during that electronic meeting so that uh, you can uh, survive an attack on your process. Hopefully that answered the question. Gil, you're muted. Oh, here, I unmuted you. Nope, I can't. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Um, so follow up to that question, is there a statute uh, that you can reference to that last question, Ken, or is it in the, every association specific to everyone's uh, governing documents? It's going to be specific to the governing documents. I just looked it up though. So Wakiowa, the section of, of Wakiowa that Ken mentioned is um, RCW 64.90.445. And that's the uh, subsection of Wakiowa that deals with association meetings. And um, just to clarify, that section of Wakiowa is not binding on all associations, but it's really good evidence of the legislature's intent in how an association would conduct an electronic or remote meeting because it has the procedures listed out that have been recently approved by the legislature. So if your association is choosing to conduct a meeting remotely, even though you don't have the authority to do that under your governing documents, Doing it in compliance with this section of Wakiowa is, we think, a really good sort of risk mitigation step to take. 
Um, and then you can also talk with your association's attorney about whether it makes sense to look into amending your documents to provide for, to specifically provide for things like voting by mail and electronic or remote meetings going forward. Yeah, there is at least one attorney giving what I think is bad or incorrect advice, telling you that the Nonprofit Corporation Act authorizes boards to adopt emergency bylaws. And they are citing RCW 24.03.070, which does say the board may adopt emergency bylaws in a manner provided by RCW 23B.02.070. And the problem with that second RCW that allows you to adopt emergency bylaws is that it specifically defines an emergency as when you cannot get a quorum of the corporation's directors. It does not define an emergency as anything like our pandemic. The idea is that if you were to have the, uh, you know, the massive earthquake and you can't get your, a quorum of the board together under an emergency, a subset of the quorum could make decisions about reopening your buildings or things like that. Uh, so I, I think the attorney was well intended in seeking out an emergency provision in a statute to allow you to adopt new bylaws temporarily. It's just that the one they've cited doesn't work. We can't find in Washington State's RCWs something which is going to give you clear legal authority to hold that electronic meeting. So what we fall back on is the notion that boards must act in good faith and reasonably. And that the Ukiowa sets out a reasonable standard on how to conduct such meetings. So if you're gonna be out of compliance anyway, hold the meeting, be out of compliance on that process, but allow your membership to actually have a voice and be informed because ultimately what you're trying to do as a community is let the community govern itself through the you know the procedures elections of members and ratifications of budgets things like that so i, I don't think a, a association is going to be uh, you know slapped down by the courts by following a reasonable process to meet the objectives of holding an annual meeting the other thing uh, I want to mention is that I think Gil sent out in a previous email a board resolution basically to retroactively approve an action that was taken technically not in compliance with the association's governing documents. And so things like sort of papering your association files with written board approval of previous actions that were taken without unanimous written approval, for example. Um, those things can also help and certainly demonstrate the board's intent to be in, in compliance as much as reasonably possible under our circumstances. All right, so are we done for today, Gil, or do we have other questions? You know, I think so. I don't see any questions coming through. I don't see anyone else who's raised their hand. I'm still trying to figure out how one does that myself on my immediate <laughs> the host, but... Um, <clears throat> Are there any other questions? I think you, you have the ability to unmute yourself um, if you do want to ask a question rather than, uh, um, rather than uh, raise your hand or send in a message to the group chat. I guess the question that's in my mind is, you know, do these continue to be worthwhile? And you know, we're happy to set up another one next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Um, as well. We have uh, 54 folks, I think, that have joined us this morning, including uh, your three hosts or two. Yeah. Any other questions? I see very worthwhile, helpful. Um, so what I'll be doing is um, we record this to the cloud and then uh, what we've done is put them on our condominium log group YouTube channel. Uh, so you can find prior recordings there. And also um, we have the Wukaiwa, W-U-C-I-O-A 
uh, recordings when we were doing uh, educational seminars on those. So if I don't, since I don't see any other questions, I think we can go ahead and call it a day. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming everybody. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe. Well, wear those masks. <laughs>